I'll start with a, a disclaimer. I think it's important that we keep in mind that the Big Bang is a model. It's a story we tell ourselves that seem to fit more or less well with the fact. And it's useful to think of the universe as having started with a Big Bang. In other words, things behave as though a Big Bang has happened 3.8 billion years ago. But that's all you are scientifically allowed to make of it. Things happen as though a Big Bang happened 13.8 billion years ago. Never mind the fact that the Big Bang is not coherently defined. Um, we can coherently define the universe until a small fraction of a second after the Big Bang. But there is no coherent account for what we mean by the Big Bang itself. It's like we extrapolate things backwards until the limit, and then we wave and say, oh, there is something be beyond that limit. We have no idea what it might be. We have no coherent account of it. But if we keep going the same direction, then something probably happened. Now, even language breaks down because to say that it happened makes no sense because the Big Bang created time. So it didn't happen in time. It's not an event that happened within time. Even within the model itself, it's incoherent to talk of the Big Bang as an event that happened in time. The model forbids you from thinking of, of that that way. So let us keep in mind that the Big Bang is a useful story that has practical applications for cosmology. It, it, uh, it helps us to model the universe if we pretend that there really was something more or less like a Big Bang a certain amount of time in the past, but that's about it. And in today's cosmology, there are competing theories. There are some very serious people in some very serious institutes like the Perimeter Institute in Canada, maybe the top institute in theoretical physics in the world today, maybe competing with the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. Um, some very smart people saying, well, and this whole story about the Big Bang, it doesn't hold any water. We need different theories. Um, to speak of M theory as an alternative and the collision of brains as an alternative to the Big Bang is sort of passe now. It was fashion in the 90s. It's not fashion anymore. There are other fashions now. Uh, the jury is still out. So be careful in assuming the literal reality of a Big Bang as an established fact. Uh, all you can do, all you're justified to do on the basis of reason and evidence is to say that the Big Bang is a useful operational model. It's a useful way in terms of which to think about the universe, but it doesn't tell you what actually happened. It only tells you that the universe seems to behave as though something like that happened. And that's all we need for science. Um, when Newton postulated this invisible force of gravity that acted at a distance and instantaneously between celestial bodies, he postulated an invisible force acting, acting at a distance. And the French, it took the French 50 years to start to stop laughing about it. It was preposterous. But, you know, apples fell as though this mysterious force existed. And that allowed Newton to write down some equations and calculate the orbits of the planets fairly accurately, with an exception for Mercury. Um, so it had its practical use. In the meantime, we know there is no such invisible force acting instantaneously at a distance. Now we think that the fabric of space-time bends and twists. It's our alternative uh, um, useful fiction. Every period in history has some useful fictions. The universe behaves as though that useful fiction were true and that's all you're allowed to interpret it as, as, a, as a useful fiction. Useful fictions change as our knowledge changes. One day we will laugh at this story that the fabric of space-time is a thing that bends and twists. Ridiculous, we know time is not even the primary. It, you know, loop quantum gravity tells us time emerges out of lower level quantum processes. So we will abandon this useful fiction, this convenient fiction, uh, for the sake of another convenient fiction. And we may abandon the Big Bang as a convenient fiction because there is another fiction that's more convenient. Remember, we are monkeys that evolved on a peripheral planet of a peripheral solar system of a very typical galaxy. 
to, to imagine that we have now, after about 200,000 years of existence on this planet, our species is 200,000 years old, and our ability to think conceptually is about 30,000 years old. It's yesterday, not even yesterday, it's last second, um, to imagine that our cognitive apparatus is now capable of accurately coming up with a literal and true model for the whole universe is preposterous. I, I see life as something the universe does just as it does a supernova, a volcano, um, just as it does a quasar, a black hole. It's part of what happens in nature. And we want to see special meaning in it because we happen to be it. But we may not have an answer for our existence any more than we have an answer for why quasars and supernovae exist. It's just part of the intrinsic potentials of the universal mind. And given enough time, it will express its potentials. Now, that doesn't mean that it's random. It's not random. It's determined by the, arch by the mental archetypes of the universe. It's, or to say the same thing in different language, it's determined by the regularities we call the laws of physics. So it's not random, it's not arbitrary. It just may not have the kind of reason that would comfort us because we look for a reason couched in some form of premeditated planning and meaning. And it may not have that. It doesn't mean that it's random. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have any reason at all. It may only mean that it doesn't have the kind of reason that we would like for our own comfort. It may have a spontaneous, instinctive reason. And that reason may be to get a grip on itself, but the mind deceives itself so much that at some point, it really wants to know itself. It wants to get a grip on itself. And dissociation may be an expression of that archetypal drive. It's instinctive, it's spontaneous, it's not the result of reasoning about it and premeditating and drawing a plan and weighing the pros and cons. No, it probably arose spontaneously, but there may be a cognitive impetus for that. Actually, it must have a cognitive impetus since the universe is a mind. And that cognitive impetus may have to do with the impetus to get a grip on itself and somehow contemplate itself from the outside. But what outside? There is no outside. It's all that exists. So it creates an outside through dissociation. And this may have been a very spontaneous process. But that's the origin of life, not the origin of the universe. Now, having made all those disclaimers about the Big Bang as just a useful fiction, and we have to be careful about how literally we interpret it and how much confidence we place on it. We shouldn't take it as, a, as an established fact for sure, because physicists don't think it's an established fact. So having made all of those disclaimers, I will venture in speculation. I think the physical universe is a symbolic representation of the universe as it is in itself. Now, am I saying something different than the dashboard metaphor? Yes, I'm adding a nuance to that. I'm saying that not only does the dashboard present measurements, but those measurements are invested with symbolic meaning. So you have to extend the, the metaphor beyond just a mechanical dashboard of an airplane, uh, which I use to appeal to your physicalist intuitions of this day and age in our culture. And you have to think of it as something that is not only mechanical, it has nuances that go beyond the mechanical aspect of the metaphor. You have to think of it as a symbolic drama, as a metaphor. Those measurements have a metaphorical nature. They symbolically point at something beyond themselves in the same way that we use symbols in our religions. And so I'm saying the same thing, but I'm inviting you to think of the metaphor as something that is not just mechanical, like the dashboard of an airplane, but as something that is invested with the full properties of mind, the cognitive abilities of mind 
to represent things through symbolic analogies and metaphors. That's how that dashboard works. It's not a just mechanical representation of measurements. Those measurements take the form of symbolism. Therefore, the whole physical universe is an expression of symbols, suggestive symbols. It's mind trying to tell itself in the only language that it knows, the language of analogy. It's mind trying to tell itself what it is. The mind of the universe trying to tell itself, the mind in us, what it is through the only language it knows, the language of symbols. That's how humans used to think before we developed conceptual language and the notion of literal truth, which is very, very, very recent uh, in human history, let alone the history of the universe. Um, therefore, everything we learn about the universe is invested in some symbolic meaning. If only we have the attention and the subtlety of perception to discern. I think what the universe is expressing through the notion of an evolution from a point of origin that came out of nothing to all the richness and variety we see today, in other words, through the model of the Big Bang, what it is trying to express to itself. I'm going to lose half of you now. Is a fundamental thing about the nature of mind which is its ability to create everything out of nothing. And of course, once we get there, you will start pointing out to all kinds of inconsistencies in whatever I say from this point on. Because what do you mean? Mind is certainly a thing, it's not nothing. How can mind come out of nothing? The invitation here from mind to itself is to try to apprehend things beyond its present day categories. We have a certain set of categories in terms of which we think those categories may be limited. Our very notion of existence and non-existence, something as opposed to nothing, those very notions may be limited. Mind creates everything out of the nothingness of the present moment. The present moment is, is a singularity. However small you make it, you can cut it in two, the past and the future. And you can play this game ad infinitum forever. There is no quantum limit <laughs> to the present moment. Um, well, according to quantum theory, there is a limit, but that limit is only the limit, the minimum amount of time in which you can say that's, that nothing has happened. Uh, it, there's a technical definition from, uh, for that, but forget about it, it's a, it's a diversion. What I'm trying to, to, to suggest to you is that if you think carefully about past, present, and future, you realize that none of the three can exist because the past only exists insofar as you remember it and you remember it now. You cannot point out there and say, there's the past. It's not anywhere. It's gone. It doesn't exist. All you have is your memories and your memories are experienced now. They don't exist in the past. You associate them with the past through your conceptual reasoning, but you only ever have the memories as experienced now. There is no past. There is no future either. Where's the future? Point to the future. It's not there. The future is a set of expectations that you experience now. Okay, so what about the present? The present exists because the future and the, and the past are in the present, right? Well, where is the present? It now, the moment I move my tongue to say, now it's gone, it's the past. The present is infinitely small. It doesn't matter how small you make it. You can cut it in two and say past and future. It is not there. And the past and the future are in it. Therefore, everything is in it. Everything is in nothing. There is nothing there. Nothing has ever happened. Nothing will ever happen. 
nothing exists, nothing is going on. And out of that nothing, everything exists. The entire richness of the drama of life, your regrets, your disappointments, your successes, your loves and your heartbreaks, everything of every living creature in this universe exists in this nothing. And that points to this fundamental thing about mind, which is to exist in nothing. Now, I'm speaking a completely different language than you're used to hearing from me. I've spoken this language in one book called More Than Allegory. Um, but otherwise, I don't go there because people who think like me will start pointing to all kinds of contradictions and inconsistencies in what I'm saying and think you're nuts. You make no sense and they would be right because what I'm saying now violates our categories and normally I surrender to our categories because that's the only way to be respected in the cultural dialogue of a culture that has elevated those categories to the position of religious truths. So you, you have no option but to surrender to that. So 90% of, of what you see from me is a surrender to our categories. I cannot reach people if I don't surrender to those categories. Now I'm making an exception to you because you're a special audience. This course experience tells me has a different kind of audience. So I'm running the risk, the same risk I run when I wrote more than allegory. And I'm trying to transcend those categories. This dichotomy between nothing and everything is entirely artificial. It is not there. It's a narrative. It's an artifact of our very, very young cognitive apparatus, which exists on this minor planet of a minor galaxy for only 200,000 years, arguably for 30,000 years, because our ability to think symbolically, conceptually, only arose much later than our human anatomy. So the Big Bang is the universal mind's symbolic attempt to tell itself about this archetypal property inherent to mind. It's telling itself, look, I exist in nothing. Everything I am is nothing and everything. Please, as a dissociated author who has developed the ability to metacognize, try to make some sense of that for me, because I myself cannot make any sense out of that. And I am profoundly distressed with it. So I'm hoping you guys out there in your lives full of suffering, will manage to get a grip. So when you die, I get some relief because I inherit some of your understanding, some of your precarious attempt to make sense of this thing about me that I know, but I can't make sense of. And I see you putting your hand on your face and I think I just drove you to La La Land. Hopefully you'll be able to return and be a functional human being after this. <laughs> Actually, just one quick technical question, because you saw I've kind of divided questions into categories and let people vote on the one they're most interested in. Th this almost feels like um, a separate category, or like how would you frame this topic? Like, could we still put it in the category of non-duality, or would you feel it's almost like the something is separate? This, the conversation about the symbolism of of um... it, 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 it is Advaita, but it's not the Western understanding of non-duality. It's too superficial. Mm -hmm. uh, what we call non-duality. Look, the, the answer to the riddle, and this, this is not coming from me, I mean, it's coming from me too in the sense that I resonate with it, so I make it my own, but I'm not the first one to say this. The answer to the riddle has to do with self-reference. Computer scientists call it recursion. It's when a function calls itself to solve a problem. This self-reference is the answer to the riddle of how everything can exist out of nothing. And in the Vedas, I mean, this, this in so many places, but there is a segment in which there are many myths, you know, and the Vedas is a collection of all kinds of oral histories. Um, but in one, it said that um, Brahman created the primordial waters, and then it planted its seed in the primordial waters and gave birth, birth to itself within its own creation. Now, what do you mean to, to be given birth to means that you begin your existence at, at birth, but if you give birth to itself, you have to pre-exist your own birth. And pff, no, 
short circuit uh, because it doesn't fit into our normal categories. But the answer to the riddle has to do with exploring this idea of self-reference to a degree that makes the rational mind entirely uncomfortable and trying to hold on to that cognitive tension, to that cognitive dissonance for as long as you can possibly can, because the sages say that at some point, if you hold on to that tension long enough, at some point, it dissolves into clarity, a clarity of obviousness of of something that is so self-evident, so much under your nose that you can't see it. It's the most familiar of all answers, although it's the deepest of all riddles. That's what the sages promise. I don't know, I haven't been there. <laughs> all I can tell you is I understand the question mm -hmm. and not trying to speak highly of myself or anybody who understands the question, but understanding the question is halfway, I think. Maybe I'm being too optimistic. I understand the question. And the riddle is, how does something come out of nothing? That's what the Big Bang model is hinting at, because it's literally what it's saying. It's the, you, everything came out of nothing. Wrap your head around it. So why do we have this model? Because that's what the universe is symbolically suggesting to itself through us as the riddle of existence. And it's hoping that we can wrap our heads around that riddle. Because without us, the universe is acquainted with the riddle because it is the riddle. It is the embodiment of the riddle. So it is acquainted with it. It sees it, but it cannot make sense of it. It cannot get to a level of comfort that it goes and, okay, now I, I'm all right with this. No, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable in the same way that you would be uncomfortable if a great question about your past was unanswered. If you didn't know your origins, if you didn't know how you came about. Now, people who don't know that because they were adopted, they struggle with this question. I'll multiply that by gazillions, and you may have an idea of the discomfort of the universal mind uh, and, and why dissociation arose, which is how this question was triggered. Maybe it has to do with trying to answer that question by taking a step outside of itself, because for as long as you are it, you are the riddle, you can't answer it. You have to take a step outside of the riddle to contemplate it more objectively in order to have any hope to unravel it. So how does the thing that is the only thing that exists take a step outside the riddle, which is itself? Well, it dissociates and then presents the riddle to its own dissociated authors in the hope that from that exterior, seemingly pseudo exterior perspective in which we are dissociated from the emotional charge of the riddle, and most people don't even think about it. So we are dissociated from the emotional charge of that riddle, which gives us a position of objectivity. The problem is we are so dissociated that we can't even see the riddle anymore, <laughs> can't even contemplate the riddle. So we have to take a step outside and then slowly reapproach the riddle, not too fast, otherwise you just end up where you began, um, but enough that you can recognize the riddle. And you're still not it again. You're still outside of it, but you're close enough that you recognize. This may be the dance of life. How do you answer the riddle? How can everything exist in nothing? And it's obvious that this is exactly what's going on. The past is not there. The future is not there. The present is infinitely small. And yet everything happens in it. What the hell? It's obvious. This is what, there is no doubt that this is what's happening. Everything is unfolding out of nothing, in no time. Nothing's happening. And yet everything is in this nothing that's happening. Wrap your head around that. That's the, that's the universe's invitation through the dance of galaxies and galaxy clusters and quasars and exploding supernovae and monkeys on planet Earth. That's the invitation. Have a look, pay attention and make something out of it that can benefit the whole after you're no longer dissociated. So you can bring it back. <laughs>